Welcome to the first annual March and Rally calling for the total abolition of nuclear weapons. <laughs> My name is Kathy Railsback and I'm the resident activist and caretaker at the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action in beautiful Kitsap County, Washington. The lovely center where I live and work is has 3.8 acres, which is half forested. With, we have beautiful ferns and cedars. It's home to, um, it's also home to the Northwest Peace Pagoda. Uh, and if you have questions about the Peace Pagoda, we have a couple of the monks here and several others who are building the first Peace Pagoda on the West Coast. And they could use help in building if you are interested in volunteering. Uh, so the center where I live is the home also to, going to be the home to the Northwest Peace Pagoda. And in addition to our cedars and our ferns, we have sunflowers, we have roses, foxes, and rabbits, and possibly a bear. Uh, however, so it's lovely, but just uh, 1.4 miles from where I live and sleep, on the other side of our chain link fence lies the Kitsap Banger Naval Base which houses the largest number of deployed nuclear warheads in the Western Hemisphere. So it's 1.4 miles from where I live. It's about roughly 20 miles from where many of you live. There's an enormous supply of nuclear warheads that most people do not seem to be aware of and do not seem to even want to acknowledge. It is, it is difficult to, to think about, but we have to. Um, so, we're, we're very excited to be having this event today. Uh, we discussed it, and as far as any, any of us knew, it's like the first anti-nuclear weapon, pro-peace and justice uh, movement march and rally in Seattle in decades. And this movement is new, so. And I, I want. 2010. Oh, 2010. Somebody told me there was one in 2000. Max just mentioned there was one in 2010. Yeah, it's too long. That's exactly right. So this movement is needed now more than ever. Uh, first, and I want to say a few reasons why I think it's needed more than ever. Uh, first, we're nowhere close to cleaning up the historical, environmental, and human uh, devastation that was caused historically just by the production and testing of these weapons. Tara Vialba, Vialba uh, who was scheduled to speak but had unfortunately had to cancel, uh, she wrote a very powerful article recently about the devastation caused across Washington state to indigenous lands. Um, in the article, she talks about Hanford and how it sits uh, in a tr on a treaty covered land and also the uranium mines that are that still contain that are still contaminated uh, in Spokane that they're on the um, on the ancestral Spokane tribal territory. Uh, Rachel Hoffman, who's going to be speaking uh, shortly, uh, is, is going to tell us about the human and environmental destruction caused by nuclear weapons testing in the Marshall Islands. So the, the broader environmental damage caused by war and milita militarism, such as at the Manchester Fuel Depot, just six miles from Alki Beach, uh, that holds millions of gallons of jet fuel, jet and diesel fuel, uh, and 34 enormous World War II era tanks. And, and these tanks, these old tanks, are located just uh, either on or within 50 feet right now of a seismic fault zone. I, I mention that not because it's specifically related to nuclear weapons, but it shows uh, a carelessness on the part of our military regarding, uh, regarding environmental devastation. On a still broader view, uh, the ob and getting back to nuclear weapons, uh, the obscene amount of money spent on nuclear weapons is causing more damage around the world um, and devastating damage. Uh, according to the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, uh, the U.S. spent $44.2 billion last year in 2021 on nuclear weapons. That works out to 84000 roughly $84,000 every minute of the year. Uh, or about $1,400 a second. Uh, that, so that, uh, 
that statistic about the $1,400 per second really caught my eye because earlier this week, I was reading an article about global hunger. Um, the World Food Program uh, announced this week, you know, with the gathering of the UN, that we are, we are in the midst of a global food crisis, an unprecedented global food crisis, the largest in recent history. Uh, up to right now, up to 345 million people are estimated to be uh, acutely food insecure or at high risk across 82 countries. Uh, and this figure has doubled since 2019. Uh, the number of people around the world that are that are at, at risk of starvation. In fact, uh, the reason I, I noticed that fact about the uh, 84,000 every minute spent on nuclear weapons, I was comparing it to the statistic that every four seconds right now, uh, someone is dying of starvation in the world. So every four seconds we're losing someone needlessly to starvation. At the same time, we're spending 84,000 a minute on nuclear weapons that we clearly do not need. Um, and in related to this this fact, there was a group. Uh, there were 234 international groups, uh, NGOs, sent uh, sent an open letter to the um, to the United Nations, uh, talking about the crisis. And this is part of their letter: from Somalia to Haiti. South Sudan to Yemen, Afghanistan to Nigeria, people's lives in the most fragile contexts are being devastated by a global food crisis fueled by a deadly mix of conflict, climate change, rising costs, and economic crises exacerbated by COVID-19 and the Ukraine conflict. 50 million people are now just one step away from starvation. Over 345 million more are bowing under the crushing weight of hunger, struggling to feed their families and at risk of death. They make the point that these people are not starving, they are being starved. They are being starved by countries in the world like us that are spending obscene and immoral amounts of money on warfare, including nuclear weapons. So, we, uh, I say unnecessary, it's clearly unnecessary. We don't need to be spending that much money on nuclear, new nuclear weapons. We already have enough nuclear weapons to blow up the world many times over. Why, how could anyone justify spending one penny? How dare we spend one more penny on nuclear weapons when we have somebody dying a needless death of, of starvation? So, we must establish a new, a new nonviolent movement uh, to continue Dr. King's uh, campaign started decades ago against militarism, racism, materialism, and now people are adding environmental destruction. Uh, the spirit of nonviolence is to build and remains, was and remains the idea of building a beloved community, a community in which everyone is respected and has dignity. Um, Please join me and join us in this movement uh, beginning today, beginning now. One note about today that I just want to mention, in the spirit of nonviolence, um, we engage with any opponents with love, with the goal of bringing everyone, bringing everyone along with us. Uh, in that spirit for today, we would ask if we do encounter any counter protesters or people that that are heckling or expressing anger or violence towards us, we would ask everyone present to please respond in a nonviolent manner uh, with love and respect and self-discipline as we begin to model the world that we seek to build, a, a world where we don't resolve conflicts with violence or threats of violence, either explicit or implicit. Uh, we can't, we don't pretend to achieve peace and security by wielding weapons and or threats of a future of force at any level, either at the personal level or the community level or the international level. So please join me. We need you. Many of the folks in this movement have been working against nuclear weapons since the 70s, and they tell me they're tired. <laughs> so, so we need help. We need help. Uh, we need people with all sorts of skills. Uh, you can see me or any of the volunteers if you would like to become involved in this new movement. Thank you very much. I would like to now um, introduce our second speaker, 
um, another good friend of mine, Tom Rogers. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, I think most of you already support the abolition of nuclear weapons. I'm going to share some ideas about how to get there. I had a 32-year career in the Navy as a submarine officer. When I commanded a nuclear submarine, I was directly responsible for nuclear weapons. I understand the horrible, destructive power of nuclear weapons. I understand that nuclear weapons are an existential threat to humanity. If I fail to oppose a national security strategy based on the threat of nuclear annihilation, then I am complicit. Each of us has that responsibility. So I have been a member of the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action for about 20 years. I'm often surprised that local people don't know about GZ, so I thought I'd uh, uh, insert a, a little history lesson. The term ground zero first appeared in the Webster Dictionary in 1946. It was defined as, quote, the aim point of a nuclear weapon detonation, end quote. In 1977, Jim Douglas and a group of young activists, some of whom are, are here today. I'm looking for Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. Purchased land next to the Bangor Weapons Depot, 20 miles from here, across the Sound. They established Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action, a place of peace. And of course, as we all know, the Weapons Depot was the future site of the Trident Submarine Base and Strategic Weapons Facility Pacific. If we fail to eliminate nuclear weapons, that sacred place will in fact be ground zero of the last war on planet Earth. According to the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, there are over 12,500 nuclear warheads in the world today. And the US and Russia account for over 11,400 of them. Closer to home, the Bulletin estimates there are about 1,300 warheads based right next to Ground Zero across the sound from us here today. Excluding the U.S. and Russia, that is more warheads than the whole rest of the world combined. There are nine nuclear weapon states. Bangor houses more weapons than seven of them put together. And proximity to those weapons motivates me to do the work I'm doing. And hopefully it, it can motivate you as well. At the height of the Cold War, in the late 80s, there were over 70,000 warheads in the world. And 80% of those are gone now. But since 2010, the reductions have been very modest. Friends, we are here today to call on our government to aggressively reduce our nuclear stockpiles with a goal of complete nuclear weapons elimination. <laughs> Yahoo. This is a really simple process. I'll break it down for you. Currently, the US has about 2,000 intact retired warheads in bunkers waiting to be dismantled. Retired warheads are, are low-hanging fruit for us. 
they can be dismantled unilaterally, dramatically reducing the U.S. stockpile by nearly 40 percent with no change in the government's national security strategy. And Russia has a comparable number of obsolete weapons and could do the same. Last year, we came perilously close to allowing the New START Treaty to expire. That's the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. And the key word in that acronym is reduction. New START is the one treaty that limits the number of deployed warheads that the US and Russia can maintain. Deployed warheads means uh, warheads that are mated to ballistic missiles or co-located with bombers ready to launch. New START was scheduled to expire on February 5th, 2021, just two weeks after the start of the Biden administration. The Trump administration opposed extending the existing treaty and failed to negotiate a new treaty. I want to commend the Biden administration and the Russian government for managing to extend the treaty only two days before it expired. It's now in force until 2026. So why is that important? Why, why do we care about uh, the New START treaty? Well, without New START, there is no limit on the numbers of deployed warheads. And more importantly, the inspections, intrusive inspections and notifications that are conducted by both sides to enforce the treaty would have ceased. We would have lost that window into what the Russians are doing and they too would lose the window into what we're doing. Currently, New START limits the number of deployed warheads in ballistic missile submarines, land-based missile silos, and strategic bombers to 1,550. But New START doesn't limit the number of warheads that are held in reserve. There are reserve warheads stored in bunkers at the Strategic Weapons uh, Facility Pacific, just 20 uh, miles from here, at the Kings Bay, Georgia Strategic Weapons Facility, at a Minuteman base in Wyoming, and at bomber bases, two different bomber bases in the Midwest. And there are actually more reserve warheads than deployed warheads. If New START had failed, there would be no limit on deployed warheads. There should be no doubt that the U.S. Strategic Command has a plan to rapidly deploy those warheads if New START fails. Now is the time to call on our government to renegotiate New START with Russia and we should demand that the new treaty provide for a transition that results in a level playing field with Russia, China, and the other six nuclear weapon states, and forms a basis for future negotiations leading to total elimination of nuclear weapons. First, that treaty must reduce the number of deployed warheads to a minimum, a minimum deterrent and that's defined as a level that still provides an adequate deterrent strategy. And several government and non-governmental studies have concluded that numbers of warheads between 300 and 1,000 are, are a credible deterrent. Uh, there's a lot of metrics that go into that, uh, warhead yields, numbers of launchers, and that accounts for the, the broad range from 300 to 1,000. Uh, I think 500. It's a nice even number, uh, and uh, 500 of the types of warheads currently deployed is a good target, a good starting point. As deployed warheads are reduced under the next New START Treaty, the number of launchers must also be reduced. And that means many, many silos, 
submarines and bombers must be decommissioned. It's hard to it's hard to get rid of old submarines. I know that for a fact. Next, the treaty must limit the number of non-deployed or reserve warheads. And that part is necessary just to, for technical reasons to provide some flexibility for temporary storage of weapons uh, during maintenance. And 150 is a reasonable number there. Next, the treaty must continue enforcement through intrusive on-site inspections, open skies agreements, and notifications of weapons movements and tests. Finally, the treaty must provide for verification of warhead dismantling and launcher decommissioning. Now, we recognize that the war in Ukraine complicates bilateral negotiations with Russia. But it is absolutely vital that they move forward. We call on the Biden State Department to do this now and not pass this important work to the next administration. We also call on the Biden administration to enter into similar bilateral negotiations with China to stem its plans for nuclear weapons expansion during a period where the U.S. is actually making reductions. Decommissioning and dismantling warheads and launchers under the next new start would lower U.S. and Russian stockpiles to about 650 warheads each. And during this process, the total stockpiles of the other seven nuclear weapon states combined would remain around 1,000 warheads. This is a manageable number to enter the final phase. At this level, or close to it, multilateral negotiations among all nine weapons states under the terms of Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty can finally reach fruition. With a plan for complete elimination of nuclear weapons under strict and effective international control, all nine nuclear weapon states and their allies can then enter into the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Verification is key to nuclear disarmament. We know that cooperative verifications work. They have worked for New START the U.S. and Russia have conducted hundreds of intrusive inspections, thousands of notifications to verify the deployed launchers and warheads under that treaty. Similar inspections under the control of the United Nations can and will ensure compliance. It's that simple. We can do this. Imagine the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Peace is possible. Thank you.
name is Rachel Hoffman. Uh, my mother is Marshallese and my father is Jewish. Um, so that makes me a little bit of an exile. Um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, so I first want to acknowledge that we are here in Seattle, Washington, more honorably known as the Coast Salish Lands. So I am here to plea for peace along with you and, and to share with you why nuclear weapons should have been banned a long time ago. And I'm going to share this through the perspective of the Marshallese people. So my maternal family are from the Marshall Islands of Mele, Anno, Libyap, Medjet, and Namurik. And these five island atolls that I just named were not considered islands that were exposed to nuclear radiation. Um, and the nuclear ra radiation was fired through the tests that were violently detonated on our islands through the land, ocean waters, crops, animals, and their very own people. But the experts of the islands, the Marshallese, they know that we have all been touched by the nuclear radiation. The Marshall Islands consist of 1,200 small atolls and islets, and our atolls are gracefully lying upon craters that have been formed over finely aged and active volcanoes. To give you an idea of an atoll, I can tell you about our capital island, Mejoro. It has about a strip of land that is 25 miles long. I'm, I'm sorry, I should say it's about 25 miles long. And it's circular, and like I said, it's a rim on top of an inactive volcano on a coral reef. And it is the largest city that we have in our nation. In the U.S., we are considered COFA citizens. So COFA stands for the Compact of Free Association, and we are considered non-immigrants. It allows our people to live and work in the U.S. COFA citizens include people from the Marshall Islands, as well as the Republic of Palau and the Federated States of Micronesia. In exchange of this non-immigrant status, the U.S. uses parts of our islands for military strategic positioning. Excuse me. And although we have this non-immigrant status, our people have struggled with access to health care, certain jobs, and higher education, to say the very least. So the blockades have confined us in a very unique and uncomfortable position for people in our communities where they rely on allies, community leaders, and just anyone who is willing to give their time. Today we have grassroots organizations that are uh, guiding our families in the areas of food supplementation, healthcare access and advocacy, housing navigation, and so much more. In Snohomish County, our Marshallese leaders have a startup organization called the Marshallese Association of the North Puget Sound, and I wish they were here with me today. Uh, we estimate that about 10,000 Marshallese people reside in Snohomish, Skagit, King, and Pierce counties. Most of these families are facing extreme symptoms of what we call marginalization, and this takes place in healthcare facilities, in our housing crisis, in our schools. In fact, thousands of our kids are entering our elementary schools and exiting without a college degree. Within the past few decades, I'd say that less than 20 people who are Marshallese have a college degree. I refuse to sleep on these numbers, so I currently teach elementary students in Snohomish County and work closely with allies to combat these issues in schools. In my opinion, our future is indeed our hope to revitalize our communities in our area. Now what does all of this have to do with the protest against nuclear weapons? Where do I even begin with that? When U.S. gained control of our islands, it led directly to colonialism and imperialism over our islands. We were manipulated into believing and trusting that surrendering our islands to the U.S. government would enhance the security for the whole entire world. 
This leads to the most dangerous, it led to the most dangerous genocide that continues to affect every Marshallese in ways that I described earlier. But there's so much more. Nuclear tests were conducted in our islands from 1946 to 1958, as many of you know. And there were 67 weapons that were detonated, and that's equivalent to 1.6 Hiroshima bombs every day for 12 years. The Marshallese have a full understanding of how nuclear war affects the environment, and Dr. Holly Barker continues to say it, how they, it affects our health, our economy, and every aspect of our life. And I also want to just take a moment to thank her for spending so much time in her work and dedication to unveil the secrecy of U.S. nuclear testing in our islands, along with our beloved Marshallese champions who shared their stories with her and spoke at length of their lived effects of nuclear war. Many of my elders remember seeing a bright orange sky when one of the 67 weapons wiped out a sustaining island nation called Bugani, who people now know of as a bathing suit or a SpongeBob's home, of which both sickeningly derive from this terrible event in U.S. history. The Bravo bomb detonated on March 1, 1954 on Bugani Atoll destroyed one of the most beautifully biodiverse islands in our nation within seconds. Within the first second of the detonation, a fireball formed five miles across the ocean and continued invisibly for 300 miles. A mushroom cloud rose to 47,000 feet and grew up to seven miles in diameter in the span of one minute. It continued to grow for 10 minutes and then reached 130,000 feet and 62 miles in diameter at a rate of 100 meters per second. This was the moment when my elders This was the moment when my elders and ancestors saw that red sky. When the kids ate the fallout that they thought was snow in Bromala. And when Project 4.1 helped scientists understand how fallout and nuclear weapons affect the health of human beings. Are we still being observed today? as our family members walk in and out of Harborview Hospital with cancers derived from this nuclear legacy. Perhaps many of you understand the lifespan of radioactive chemicals and maybe you know about Bruna Dome in Enoedak where there is a leak of radioactive wastes seeping into the Pacific Ocean and of course, some of our, not much of our nuclear waste is buried under the Hanford nuclear waste site and leaking into the Columbia River. So we know about that half-life. But what you may not understand is the shredding of my cultural web as we lose one elder after another, all too quickly, as a result of nuclear weapons, and how many children have we lost through miscarriages? How the joy has been robbed from our families as we rely on government subsidized programs in this country. This is not who we are. We have been displaced first from nuclear testing and now we are facing the reality of climate change. And all that power that is being played with here is causing us to plead for action today. I'm so honored to be with all of you guys here, and thank you for listening to my story, and um, I can't wait to meet some of you all. So. He's a very well-known activist. His biography is on there. I would just say to him, thank you for speaking at the, area, the events you have in this area, and welcome to the stage. 
Thank you. I am so sick and tired of wars, and I'm ready for peace. What about you? Glad to hear it. But pretty much everybody is for peace, even the people who think the surest way to peace is through more wars. They have a peace poll in the Pentagon, after all. I'm pretty sure they ignore it more than worship it, although they do make a lot of human sacrifices for the cause. When I ask a room of people in this country if they think any side of any war could be justified or ever has been justified, 99 times out of 100, I quickly hear shouts of World War II or Hitler or Holocaust, the very war that used nuclear weapons. Now, I'm going to do something I do not usually do and recommend that you watch a super long film by Ken Burns on PBS, the new one on the U.S. and the Holocaust. I mean, unless you are one of those weirdo dinosaurs like me who reads books. Any of you read books? Okay, well, the rest of you, watch this film because... It eliminates the number one reason people give for supporting the number one past war they support, which is the number one propaganda foundation for supporting new wars and new weapons. I expect book readers already know this, but saving people from death camps was not part of World War II. In fact, the need to focus on waging a war was the top public excuse for not rescuing people. The top private excuse was that none of the world's countries wanted the refugees. The film covers the insane debate that went on over whether to bomb death camps to save them, but it does not tell you that peace activists, people like you, were lobbying Western governments to negotiate for the freedom of the camp's intended victims. Negotiations were held successfully with Nazi Germany over prisoners of war, just as recently, negotiations have been held successfully with Russia over prisoner exchanges and grain exports in Ukraine. The trouble was not that Germany wouldn't free people. It had been loudly demanding that anyone take them for years. The trouble was the U.S. government did not want to free millions of people. It considered a major inconvenience. And the trouble now is that the U.S. government does not want peace in Ukraine. I do hope that the U.S. will admit fleeing Russians and get to know them and like them so that we can work together with them before the U.S. gets to the point of instituting a draft. But wow, only a vocal minority in the U.S. wanted to help the victims of Nazism by some measures, we now have in the U.S. a quiet majority wanting to end the slaughter in Ukraine. But we're not all quiet all the time, are we? There was a poll by Data for Progress of Washington's 9th Congressional District at the beginning of August that found 53% of voters said they would support the U.S. pursuing negotiations to end the war in Ukraine as soon as possible, even if it meant making compromises with Russia. One of many reasons that I believe that number can go up, if it hasn't already gone up, is that in the very same poll, 78% of voters said they were concerned about the conflict going nuclear. I suspect that the 25% or more who apparently worry about a war going nuclear but believe that's a price worth paying to avoid negotiating for peace, lack a completely comprehensive understanding of what nuclear war is and have never spoken to a single person from the Marshall Islands. I think we have to go on trying every possible means of getting people to become aware of the dozens of near-miss accidents and confrontations, of how extremely unlikely it is that a single nuclear bomb will be launched rather than a great many in two directions. That the sort of bomb that destroyed Nagasaki is now merely the detonator for the sort of vastly larger bomb that nuclear war planners call small and usable. And how, of how even a limited nuclear war would create a global crop 
killing nuclear winter that could leave the living envying the dead. I understand that some people in and about Richland, Washington are trying to change some names of things and generally scale back the glorification of having produced the plutonium that massacred the people of Nagasaki. I think we should applaud that effort to undo celebration of a genocidal action. The New York Times recently wrote about Richland, but mostly avoided the key question. If it were true that bombing Nagasaki actually saved more lives than it cost, then it might still be decent for Richland to show some respect for the lives that were taken, but it would also be important to celebrate such a difficult accomplishment. But if it is true, as the facts seem to clearly establish, that the nuclear bombs did not save more than 200,000 lives, did not in fact save a single life, then celebrating them is simply evil. And with some experts believing that the risk of nuclear apocalypse has never been greater than it is right now in this moment, it does matter that we get this right. The Nagasaki bombing was actually moved up from August 11th to 9th, 1945, to decrease the likelihood of Japan surrendering before the bomb could be dropped. So whatever you think of nuking one city, when many of the nuclear scientists wanted a demonstration on an uninhabited area rather than the nuking of a city, it's hard to concoct a justification for nuking a second city. And in fact, there was no justification for destroying the first one. The U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey set up by the U.S. government concluded that, quote, Certainly prior to December 31st, 45, and in all probability prior to November 1st, Japan would have surrendered even if the atomic bombs had not been dropped and even if Russia had not entered the war and even if no invasion had ever been planned or contemplated. A dissenter who expressed that same view to the Secretary of War and by his own account to President Truman prior to the bombings was a guy named General Dwight Eisenhower. General Douglas MacArthur, prior to the bombing of Hiroshima, put together a press conference and announced that Japan had already been beaten. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral, Admiral William D. Leahy, said quite angrily in 49, quote, the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. President Truman justified the Hiroshima bombing not as speeding the end of a war, but as revenge against Japanese offenses. For weeks, Japan had been willing to surrender if it could keep its emperor. The U.S. refused that until after the bombs fell. So the desire to drop the bombs may have lengthened the war. We should be very clear that this claim that the bombs saved lives originally made slightly more sense than it does now. Because it was about white lives. Now everyone is too embarrassed to include that part of the claim, but goes on making the basic claim anyway even though murdering 200,000 people in a war that could be over if you would just end it is perhaps the very furthest thing imaginable from saving lives. It seems to me that schools, rather than using mushroom, mushroom clouds for logos, should focus on doing a little bit better job of teaching history. And I mean all schools. Why do we believe in the end of the Cold War? Who taught us that the Cold War ended? The supposed ending of the Cold War never involved either Russia or the U.S. reducing its stockpiles below what it would take to destroy virtually all life on Earth multiple times. Not in the understanding of scientists 30 years ago and certainly not now when we know more about nuclear winter. The Cold War's supposed ending was a matter of political rhetoric and media focus, but the missiles didn't go away. The weapons never came off the missiles in the U.S. and Russia as in China, 
Neither the U.S. nor Russia ever committed to not starting a nuclear war. The Treaty on Non-Proliferation's commitment appears never to have been an honest commitment in Washington, D.C. I hesitate even to quote what it says for fear someone in Washington, D.C. will learn it exists and tear it up. But I'm going to quote a bit of it anyway. The treaty's parties committed to, quote, pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control, end quote. I would like the U.S. government to sign on to a lot of treaties, including treaties and agreements it has torn up, like the Iran Agreement, the Inter Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, and including treaties it has never signed, such as the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. But none of them are as good as existing treaties that we could demand compliance with, such as the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which bans all war, or the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which requires complete disarmament of all weapons. Why do we have these laws on the books that are so much better than the things we even dream of legislating that we find it easy to accept the propaganda claim that they don't actually really exist, that we should believe our televisions rather than our own lying eyes? The answer, I think, is pretty simple. The peace movement of the 1920s was stronger than we can imagine. And the anti-war and anti-nuclear movement of the 1960s was pretty darn good as well. Both of those movements were created by ordinary people exactly like us, except with less knowledge and experience. We can do the same and better. But we need to get mad about nuclear madness. We need to act as if every speck of beauty and wonder on earth were threatened with swift annihilation because of the buffoonish arrogance of some of the dumbest people alive. We really are dealing with madness. And that means that we need to explain what's wrong with it for those who will listen while building a movement of political pressure for those who need to be pushed. Why is it madness? to want the biggest, baddest weapons around purely to deter irrational foreigners from unprovoked attacks like the one Russia was just so carefully provoked into? Presumably you all know that being provoked into something doesn't excuse doing it, but I'm probably required to say that anyway. Here are 10 quick reasons why wanting nukes is madness. One. Let enough years go by and the existence of nukes will kill us by accident. Two, let enough years go by and the existence of nukes will kill us all through the act of some lunatic. Three, there is nothing better that a nuclear weapon can do to deter anything than what a massive pile of non-nuclear weapons can do. But wait for number four. Nonviolent action has proven a more successful defense against invasions and occupations than the use of weapons. Five, threatening to use a weapon in order to never have to use it creates a high risk of disbelief, confusion, and actually using it. Six, employing large numbers of people to prepare to use a weapon creates momentum for using it, which is part of the explanation of what happened in 45. Seven, Hanford, like many other places, it's sitting on waste that some call an underground Chernobyl waiting to happen and nobody has figured out a solution, but generating more waste is considered unquestionable by those in the grip of the madness. Eight, the other 96% of humanity is no more irrational than the 4% in the United States, but no less so either. Nine, when the Cold War can be restarted simply by choosing to notice that it never ended and when it can turn hot in an instant, failing to radically change course is the definition of insanity. Ten, Vladimir Putin as well as Donald Trump, Bill Clinton, two Bushes, Richard Nixon, Dwight Eisenhower, and Harry Truman has threatened to use nuclear weapons. These are people who believe in keeping their threats far more than in keeping their promises. The U.S. Congress 
openly claims the complete inability to stop a president. And according to a Washington Post columnist this week, we don't need to worry about Vladimir Putin's threats because the U.S. has just as many nukes as he does. The entirety of our world is not worth the gamble that some nuclear emperor in the U.S. or Russia or somewhere else won't follow through on the threats. Madness has been cured many times, and nuclear madness need be no exception. Institutions that have lasted many years and which were labeled inevitable, natural, essential, and various other terms of similarly dubious import have been ended in various societies. These include cannibalism, human sacrifice, trial by ordeal, blood feuds, dueling, polygamy, capital punishment, slavery, and Bill O'Reilly's Fox News program. Most of humanity wants to cure the nuclear madness so badly that they're creating new treaties to do it. Most of humanity has passed up ever possessing nukes. South Korea, Taiwan, Sweden, and Japan have chosen not to have nukes. Ukraine and Kazakhstan gave up their nukes. So did Belarus. South Africa gave up its nukes. Brazil and Argentina chose not to have nukes. Although the Cold War was never ended, such dramatic steps were taken in disarmament that people imagined it was ending. Such awareness of the issue was created 40 years ago that people imagined the problem simply must be being solved. And we've seen a glimmer of that awareness again this year. When the war in Ukraine burst into the news this past spring, the scientists who keep the doomsday clock had already in 2020 moved the second hand closer to apocalyptic midnight, leaving little room left to move it even closer later this year. But something changed, at least noticeably, in US culture. A society that, while it does little of significance to slow climate collapse, is very openly aware of that apocalyptic future, suddenly began talking a little bit about the apocalypse on fast forward that would be a nuclear war. The Seattle Times even ran this headline, Washington stopped planning for a nuclear war in 1984, should we start now? It is madness, I tell you. The Seattle Times promoted the belief in the lone nuclear bomb and in individual solutions. There is very little reason to imagine that a single nuclear bomb will be launched without numerous accompanying bombs and numerous bombs responding almost immediately from the other side. Yet more attention is being paid right now to how one should behave when a single bomb hits than to far more likely scenarios. The city of New York put out a public service announcement telling residents to go indoors. Advocates for those without homes are outraged by the unfair impact of nuclear war, even though a real nuclear war will favor only cockroaches. And for a small percentage of what we spend preparing for it, we could give every single person a house. We we heard earlier today about the iodine pills solution. A non-individual response to this quintessentially collective problem would be to organize pressure for disarmament, whether joint or unilateral. Unilateral departure from madness is an act of sanity. And I believe we can do it. The people who organized this event today using abolishnuclearweapons.org can organize others. Our friends at Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action know exactly what they're doing. If we need creative public art to get our message through, the Backbone Campaign on Vashon Island can handle it. Up on Whidbey Island, the Whidbey Environmental Action Network and their allies just kicked the military out of state parks. And the Sound Defense Alliance is working to get the ear-splitting death planes out of the skies. While we need more activism, there is much more than we usually know already happening. At diffusenuclearwar.org, you'll find planning underway across the U.S. for emergency anti-nuclear actions in October. Can we get rid of nuclear weapons and keep nuclear energy? I doubt it. Can we get rid of nuclear weapons and keep mountainous stockpiles of non-nuclear weapons positioned on a thousand bases in other people's countries? I doubt it. 
But what we can do is take a step and watch every subsequent step grow easier because a reverse arms race makes it so, because education makes it so, and because momentum makes it so. If there's anything politicians like better than incinerating entire cities, it's winning. If nuclear disarmament begins winning, it can expect a lot more friends to climb aboard. But right now, there is not a single member of the US Congress seriously sticking their neck out for peace, much less a caucus or a party. Lesser evil voting will always have the strength of logic it has, but none of the choices on any ballots includes human survival, which merely means that just as throughout history, we need to do more than voting. What we can't do is allow our madness to become meanness or our awareness to become fatalism or our frustration to become a shifting of responsibility. This is all of our responsibility, whether we like it or not. But if we do our very best, working in community with a vision of a peaceful and nuclear-free world before us, I think we just might find the experience likable. And if we can form everywhere pro-peace, communities like the one we've been part of this morning, I believe we can make peace. Thank you.